Imagine if you were these amino acids watching the display of a string of amino acids, the chain of polypeptides, as well as the large protein molecules. Don't you think, as an amino acid, you will wonder how can you become a large macromolecule? Well, the secret to it is in today's episode of BioWorld. You see, we are going to learn about the formation of peptide bonds in polypeptides. Let's begin. For amino acids to become proteins, the first step involves condensation. When two amino acids join together, they form a dipeptide molecule. Let me show you in detail. Here is one amino acid with the carboxylic acid end facing the amino end of the other amino acid. An attraction will occur between the hydroxyl of one amino acid and the hydrogen of the other amino acid. This attraction will form a molecule of water and the carbon of one amino acid will now form a bond with the nitrogen of the other amino acid. So the carbon-nitrogen bond here, this new bond here, is called the peptide bond. Dipeptides have a single peptide bond and during the condensation process, one molecule of water forms. Now, if we repeat the condensation once more, we get a tripeptide molecule because there are three amino acids involved. However, the number of peptide bonds will only be two and only two molecules of water will form. I highlight this factor because previously we've studied triglycerides. Notice that triglyceride and tripeptide start with the word tri. So this is where confusion may arise among students. Now in the case of a triglyceride, remember, three ester bonds form. So when three ester bonds form, three molecules of water are produced. Now repeated condensation will naturally form a polypeptide and this polypeptide can then rearrange to become a protein molecule. Since we now know how condensation occurs to form a protein, let's move on to the properties of protein, which include amphoteric, buffer, isoelectric point, and colloid. To make all these properties possible, we must understand one other characteristic of protein. The characteristic I'm talking about is Zwitter ion. Definition, it is a molecule that will have both positive as well as negative charge. We've seen this in an amino acid. The amine end is positive because the hydrogen from the acid end has migrated to the nitrogen and the acid end is negatively charged because it has lost the hydrogen. However, the amino acid is still neutral because both the charges balance. But now we are discussing proteins. Now, even though condensation happens and peptide bonds form between each amino acid, but the ending of the first amino acid will have the amine group, which is positively charged, and the ending of the last amino acid will have the negatively charged carboxylic end. So you see, even a protein is still a Zwitter ion because it has both positive as well as negative charge. Now that you understand the Zwitter ion nature of protein, let us see how protein responds when placed in solutions of different pH. We will start with a basic solution. 
basic solutions will have high concentration of negatively charged hydroxyl ions. The protein, when placed in this solution, will release hydrogen ions into the solution. The positively charged hydrogen ions will react with the negatively charged hydroxyl ions to form water. In this way, the basic solution's pH will be maintained. However, notice that now the protein has become negatively charged. So, proteins when placed in a basic solution become an anion. What do you think happens if proteins are placed in an acidic solution? To explain that, let me return the protein into a Zwitter ion. And now, let's look at the acidic solution. Acidic solutions will have high concentrations of positively charged hydrogen ions. What will happen next is these hydrogen ions will bind with the negative end of the protein. So when the negative oxygen binds to the positive hydrogen ion, they are neutralized. The removal of the hydrogen ions from the acidic solution will help maintain the pH of the solution. But this will cause the protein now to become positively charged. Meaning that proteins, when placed in an acidic solution, actually become cations. So in conclusion, you can see that in a basic solution, proteins behave as an acid. And in an acidic solution, proteins behave as a base. This is the meaning of amphoteric. That is, a molecule that has both basic and acidic properties. At the same time, I've also explained protein's characteristic as a pH buffer, where you can see that the protein molecules, by either releasing the hydrogen ions or accepting a hydrogen ion, helps maintain the pH of solutions at a constant level. What we learned about protein being an amphoteric molecule as well as being a pH buffer is connected to its isoelectric point. The symbol for isoelectric point is a small p and a capital I. The meaning of an isoelectric point is actually about the pH of the solution. Isoelectric points are pH of solution at which the protein will have no net charge. That is, the pH when protein remains a Zwitter ion. Now, since this is biology, don't make the mistake of thinking neutral means pH 7. It depends on the type of protein. Proteins have specific PIs. Some may have a PI of pH 3, some may have a PI of pH 7, meaning that some proteins at pH 3 are neutral and some proteins at pH 7 are neutral. So when these proteins are placed in solutions of pH below or above the PI, the Zwitter ion nature of the protein changes. If the protein is placed in a solution that is below its pi, remember pi is the pH at which it is neutral. So if the pH of the solution is less than the pH where the protein is neutral, the protein will become positively charged. It becomes a cation. And if the protein is placed in a solution with a pH that is above the pi of the protein, then that protein becomes negatively charged. It becomes an anion.
To help you understand this better, let me show you an example. In my example, this protein has a PI5. Now, I've prepared three beakers, each beaker having solutions with different pH, pH3, pH5, and pH9. Now, what happens when I put protein A in my beaker that has solution pH 5? Now, remember, PI5 means the pH at which protein A will be neutral. So, when it is placed in a pH that is equal to the PI, this protein will be a zwitter ion, meaning that it will have equal number of positive and negative charges. But if I take this protein and put it in my beaker with solution pH 3, changes happen. You see, pH 3 is below pi. So, the protein will become positively charged. It becomes a cation. Likewise, if I place the protein in my beaker of pH 9, since pH 9 is above pi, the protein will become negatively charged. This is an anion. So this is the significance of isoelectric points in which a neutral protein can become either positively charged or negatively charged. We look at the final property of protein. Proteins you see when mixed in water do not completely dissolve but instead they remain suspended in the solution forming what we call as a colloid. The picture here shows different levels of solubility. We look at the first beaker. The solution in this beaker is clear because the molecules added into this beaker are soluble. For example, sodium chloride or even monosaccharides. When these molecules are stirred in water, they completely dissolve. On the other hand, we have this beaker with some sedimentation at the bottom. This occurs when the molecule is insoluble, for example, polysaccharides. So when we add polysaccharides into water and stir, they eventually sediment to the bottom. But proteins are different. Proteins are partially soluble. So when proteins are added, the first thing that happens is water molecules will surround the protein molecule. This is because proteins are hydrophilic. Now, when the protein molecules want to start moving down to sediment, what happens is the water molecules surrounding the protein will begin to repel against one another preventing the protein from sedimenting to the bottom. So, as it remains suspended in the solution, a colloid forms. So, with that, we have seen all four properties of protein. So, we've completed our discussion on condensation as well as properties of protein. So, what's next? We'll learn about what happens to the protein after formation. Until my next video, bye-bye.